Hello guys, it's Shane Davis, 20 year comic book veteran. I'm here with none other than the beautiful, lovely, sometimes she will make me a sandwich wife of mine, Yanzi Lennon. Today we're here to talk about Scott Snyder, last ditch effort at a Hollywood deal as the comic book industry is on fire. Here we go. So this article popped up today on The Hollywood Reporter. At first, I saw what was on Twitter, kind of a crappy trailer of nothing but logos. That was it. Some names, some logos, and it got kind of repetitive because it always led with Scott Snyder, this person, Scott Snyder, this person, and it was like one after another. We're going to get into that. But then they released some covers and a little bit of information on these books. Interesting article, a lot of excuses for what Snyder's doing here. Let's get into it. Mm -hmm. So writer Scott Snyder inks sweeping deal with Amazon's Comixology. For people who don't know, Comixology is like a digital comic book service. There are some books they can read for free for a $5.99 monthly subscriptions. The rest you buy like a digital copy, you know, a per book you read. Now, so what is happening in part of this deal is that Scott Snyder's books will be released under the $5.99 subscription model. But I have been informed that that only applies to USA accounts. For example, people who use Jet Prime in Japan, they will be able to access these books, yes, but at a per purchase cost, not in a monthly subscription cost. So straight away, just so you guys know, this is really catered very strictly to the USA market. What is happening exactly and why is Scott Snyder doing this? Well, I think he himself says it here that what is happening exactly with the mainstream comic book industry, specifically the big two. Now, they say Snyder has been dreaming of these projects for years. When the coronavirus mm. pandemic hit, it expedited his desires to get them out there. Interesting times though, because when you had the coronavirus pandemic hit, you also kind of had the beginning of the fall of the big two, especially when right. DC left Diamond. Let's look at this point that he brings up about why he decided to go this route. He says, I still think about the affordability of it. Comixology is a $5.99 money subscription. Readers could check out the books before deciding if they want the collectible version in print. So he's basically saying, hey, DC, shame on you. Your books are $5.99 per issue. My books yeah. are read as much as you want for $5.99. So straight away, he's attacking the pricing model, okay, which for, DC has I, been increasing. I, 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 I got to interrupt here. First, I have to really weigh in as a comic book creator. Everything he just said is what somebody at Amazon told him to say as a selling point oh. to this venture. This isn't something I'm sure Scott's not really thinking this. And if he is thinking it, it's just like, yeah, whatever. Because if Scott really felt this way, you know, like I'm sure his prices would be different on some image books and they would be cheaper than everybody else's books. The image, whenever he has an image book, they're comparatively about the same price as the person next to him or to the right of him. So I, I, I kind of feel like that was just a bullet point for this PR fluff piece, which you have to keep in mind this is. Now, what's interesting, though, is uh, he must really not see himself really going back at DC anytime soon because he's really dismantling a lot of their business practices in this and um, mm -hmm. really putting behind digital, which Scott, as well as I know, digital really don't make no money. We all get like these digital royalties from DC Comics and our books really don't make much money digitally. Digitally, um, why? Because if you're already buying it, why buy something digital when you just go pirate it digitally? I, I really want to weigh in on this because there was an article, maybe we did a video on it, I think we did, where Amazon was talking about trying to, uh, or maybe I'm just misremembering, but Amazon was basically trying to double back down and invest more in content for streaming, which seems weird because to me, Amazon Prime is just something that I save in shipping and I there's some Amazon originals that go along with it. And then this happens. Now, um, for people who don't know, the, the the sad truth about the comic book industry, especially with creator-owned stuff, is most of it is is you know kind of geared towards, uh, hey, look at my TV pitch. And, and, and this eight random comics, Okay, and when I say random, they're actually not so random. They're actually categorized in different type of uh, movie categories, such as suspense, crime, adventure, things like that. And we'll get into that in a minute. This actually just, I, I don't think these things were in his back pocket for years. He'd been working on it for years. I think this is like, you know, a big push and he's maybe even overextending himself. I doubt many of these books will actually be good. And they all absolutely, in my opinion, look like TV pitches and actually kind of water down comics. And some of the artists on these books I actually respect, but what they're putting out as an image or, or you know, costumes or whatnot in these things, I've seen these artists all do better as far as designs and content and concept. I can't help but see a corporation, you know, um, Amazon owns Comicology 
use comicology as a tool to what, uh, develop research and development. And even if they're not making much money on it, it's still cheaper than making a TV show and spending all that money. Because you have to understand what comics, when we say research and development, you put a comic book together, you throw it out there into the ocean of the internet, you get to see what people think. Imagine if you were Netflix and you were able to know what people thought of your idea for a He-Man thing before you actually got it done and got all the backlash on YouTube and all of this stuff. What if you could actually sample something before you take those type of risks? And this is where it, this comes into play really big and quick for Amazon. So use these comics, throw it out there, and see what people say about it. And so that's this is kind of a creator's right issue, isn't it? So that's another point that Scott Snyder brings up. This is in particular very good for him and his creative teams because they have full creator rights to this. All they owe Amazon is pretty much a first refusal rights to making it into TVs and all this stuff. Now, you must right. remember that Amazon has actually had some pretty good success with superhero stuff, namely The Voice and Invincible. On that. Hang on one second. I want to stop on the first refusal. For, right. I don't want to skate past that because this is something similar that Vertigo had for years. And what that means is like um, the rights would come back to you, but they had first refusal to throw you X amount of money to keep the rights tied up. And it usually, I, I mean, it was like 10,000 here, 5,000 there, what, whatever. The, it could be different per contract. But the concept is, is they're throwing money around to keep it lasso. And and I've, I've known creators like Brian K. Vaughn or whatever think, oh, they're going to, finally give me back the rights to Pride of Baghdad. And then, nope, they threw me a check. Dang, DC. And they printed Pride of Baghdad again, and now I don't get the rights back. And a lot of creators ended up in these situations. And I, I say this to anybody in this deal, where I've known a lot of people with Vertigo deals, and I'm sure Snyder knows himself this with American um, uh, Gothic Vampire. or American Vampire that the, the reality is, is you do want your rights to come back to you. This first refusal right can keep your projects in limbo. If your goal is to get a movie or TV show or something like that, usually these deals won't work out for you because it's always cheap for the studio to throw you, uh, you know, a check. Uh, I mean, it's not cheap, but they throw you a check, but it never gets made. Whereas like if it is, if it's the balls in your court, you can always negotiate with studios and you can actually have two competing studios bidding on your project at the same time. And that, that maybe makes them actually want to put it into production more because they're actually fighting for it with another studio. Whereas like these first refusal deals, what happens is they usually just keep it in their back pocket, period. And uh, they there's no competition. There's nothing really, there's no fire forcing them to get something made. So th this necessarily doesn't always end up as a positive, depending on what the creator's goal is. I would that say sense. that considering that Amazon is trying to become a bigger power in the streaming world, this probably serves them pretty well, knowing that they are funding these books that will be just research and development for future movie or TV projects. Another criticism from Snyder over here is that he says a lot of big companies are cutting rates and becoming more corporate, which is um, something that we have seen happening, especially you'll notice if you look at the names of the creators on a lot of books these days, you will not find the big names, the famous names that you have known in the past five, 10 years alone. So yes, but at the same time, he's saying all these companies are desperate for content. There's more demand for good storytelling than ever before. So in a way, he's saying, you know what? I know you guys want a good story, but I also know you don't want to pay for it. So let me just go ahead and take it to someone who has the ability to just grab it and make it into something, and then we all win. Mm. Let's actually have a look at the list of the creatives so that Scott Snyder will be working with. So there are eight books in total. It sounds like a very big launch, by the way. Um, too big, actually. That's the issue. Is um, I don't think Snyder's ever had this many books in queue before and i don't think like usually what happens and this happened in the 90s when writers like um scott libdell or whatever were white hot they would end up with more books than they could handle and uh, the the actual integrity of the stories were not so great so like i doubt like there's no way like scott's never really had eight books he's working on at the same time so like the, i i fear that this is spread too thin. And honestly, they got to be just loose concepts. And they're well, all over the place too. I want to note that as we scroll through these, you'll notice how all over the place these are. And they fit almost every 
movie TV show category and genre. I want to point out one thing also, though, that a lot of these books, they are either going to be limited or they are potentially an ongoing. But what we do know is that there are plans for it to go into print and dark horse. So maybe instead of saying, oh, let's all go to print with dark horse straight away. This is that way of testing the market and saying, oh, this book is selling very well. Okay, then it deserves a print edition. If it's not selling well, okay, no, it stays digital. So good for you, Scott. Anyway, let's start with Barnstormers, Scott Snyder and Tula Lote. And next, here's someone we know, Scott Snyder with Jock. And this one's interesting. This is being hid like it is a comic book, but if you actually read that into it, it actually says it's a prose story with illustrations by Jock. So this mm -hmm. could maybe have eight drawings by Jock. This is not a comic book whatsoever. Yeah, it is, but they're still marketing it like it is a comic book, though. They say, oh, he's got right. all these comic books coming out. And right. it's coming out through comicsology after. So right. this is going to be a book about four young friends growing up in a strange near future where over 90% of the population are born as psychopaths. Now, let me just quickly mention that. I forgot to mention this. So this one is a high flying romance set just after the First World War. So this is a period piece. This one here is more like a supernatural psychological thriller piece. Mm. Canary, Scott Snyder, and Dan Panosian. It's 1891 and the mind collapsed into itself. Find out what the dark substance found 666 feet underground is in this western, in this horror western. So this is a period western piece. Then next we have Claire, Scott Snyder, and Francis Manapool. Right. A sci-fi mystery true, right? Oh, he already described the genre for us. Oh, right, well, right, right. You see, that's what's there. It's not a concept. It's actually what genre we're hitting, which is actually what somebody that's trying to set up streaming more would do. Duck and Cover. Duck and Cover. Um, Scott Snyder and Raphael Albuquerque. A manga-influenced teen adventure. Oh, so now he's not just sticking to Western comics. He's like, I got to hit the manga too, because manga has been outselling Western comics for the past three months, according to ICB2. So look out, whoa, Dudley Detson and the Forever Machine with Jamal Igo, a rollicking adventure story about a boy, his dog, and the machine that controls time and space. So it's a sci-fi thing. It's, it's like if Lassie work. found a time machine. I mean, that's basically it. It's like All a right. boy and its dog in a time machine. Night of the Ghoul with Francesco Francavilla, a dazzling work of horror intercutting between present day narrative and the story of a lost horror film. So again, this is a weird thing about, I guess, a horror piece, but also kind of a bit of a period thing, I guess, maybe. Right. And this one's the one that has a lot of people talking. We have Demons, which is together with Greg Capullo. The conflict between good and evil is about to come to a head when a teenage hero embarks on a journey that unveils a secret society, monsters, and mayhem. This one, if you have actually seen Greg Capullo's uh, Twitter, he actually posts a lot of pages from it or panels from it. You will see that this is probably the most superhero esque book that's probably coming out from Scott Snyder at this point. Right. So, yeah, we can see though, based on this eight books we have gone through, and there's much rumors out there. Different genres. There's rumors out there on the We Have Demons thing that that maybe was actually supposed to be printing at either Image or um, DC. So the fact that this one kind of stands out from everything else and actually seems the most like a comic book is actually kind of an testament that maybe, you know, this deal was brokered and this thing was pulled from what other publisher that it was in works with. And here it is, you know, like this maybe is the only book that would I, I would say he's sunk a lot of time and energy into. But this is a last ditch effort to Hollywood guys as the American comic book industry shuts down. Um, you know, and, and there's going to be people, we're going to see this as we go forward. There are people that that's the only intention they had in comics, but, uh, that's it for the video. If you guys will look down below, hit subscribe, ring the bell for notifications, share the video, leave me a comment. Let us know what you think about this. And also sign up for Inglorious Rex, our next Indiegogo campaign. We are getting our books in on Starlight Cats like next week ish or next. Yeah, I think not this weekend, but next weekend. So we're going to be doing fulfillment on that and launching this book soon. I'm going to leave you guys with the trailer for Inglorious Rex. Uh. Yeah. Uh. Pardon me in my tone. You can't step to my throne. They ain't working like me. I did this on my own. Just came here to win. I'm more than a man, I'm a monster. Somebody come past.
the doctor. I got a six inch for a prostate. So now I'm coming for the whole roster. It's not a game, why you playing with me? You can double back, lose track, try and hang with me. It must be in my veins. Something you can't tame, cause I break the chains.